I just want to begin our time tonight by reminding you once again of just the larger structure of what we've seen so far in the book of 1 Peter. Remember, Peter began this letter in chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 1, verse 12, by praising God for the manifold and marvelous privileges and possessions that are ours as a result of the salvation that God has granted to us in Jesus Christ by his great mercy. And then Peter moved from those indicative realities of what God has done for us in Christ in chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 1, verse 12, to five imperatives, five commands in chapter 1, verse 13, to chapter 2, verse 3, regarding how we must now live in light of that salvation. And in chapter 2, verse 4 to 10, Peter returned to another block of indicative, setting forth more of the privileges and possessions that are ours in Christ. And in chapter 2, verse 11 and following, Peter returned to another block of imperatives, commands, exhortations. You remember in chapter 2, verse 11, Peter exhorted his readers negatively to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. And then in chapter 2, verse 12, he exhorted his readers positively to keep their behavior morally excellent among the Gentiles, that is, among pagan unbelievers, so that their gospel witness before a hostile and unholy world might lead to the conversion of some who will ultimately glorify God in the day of his visitation. Well, now in chapter 2, verses 13 and following, Peter explains specifically what it looks like to keep our behavior morally excellent among pagan unbelievers. In chapter 2, verse 13, to chapter 2, verse 17, he calls for Christian citizens to submit to the government that God has placed over them. Even to pagan, unbelieving governments, like the one that Peter's readers found themselves under, led by wicked Nero. Chapter 2, verses 18 to 20, he calls for Christian household slaves to submit to their masters, even to unjust and unreasonable masters. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, he calls for Christian wives to submit to their husbands, even to pagan, unbelieving husbands. Chapter 3, verse 7, he calls for Christian husbands to live with their wives according to knowledge and understanding and to lavish them with honor and respect so that their prayers will not be hindered. And in chapter 3, verse 8, he gives general instructions to all Christians regarding how they are to relate to one another in the body, chapter 3, verse 8, as well as how they're to relate to pagan unbelievers who persecute them, chapter 3, verse 9 and following. And the point that he's communicating throughout this entire section of chapter 2, 11 to chapter 3, verse 12, is that the new birth produces a new life and changes people in ways that show up in the mainstream of human life. Namely, how we relate to government, 2, 13 to 17. What happens in the workplace, 2, 18 to 25. What happens in our homes, 3, 1 to 7. How we relate to people in the church, 3, 8. How we respond to people who persecute us, 3, 9 and following. That's the point that Peter's trying to make in this section. He's going to show us that if we genuinely have new life from God, then we will be new people who live differently than those who do not have the new birth by God's great mercy. And you can summarize or describe this in the phrase, doing what is right or doing good. In fact, let me just show you how this theme of doing what is right really threads throughout this entire section. Notice chapter 2, verse 15. Peter writes, For such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. In chapter 2, verse 20. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. Get chapter 3, verse 6. He's exhorting the women here to follow the example of Sarah. And he says, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children, if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. Look at chapter 3, verse 11. He must turn away from evil and do good. Chapter 3, verse 13. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? Chapter 3, verse 17. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. 
Look at chapter 4, verse 19. Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. And so all throughout this section, Peter is talking about what it looks like to live out the new life that we've been given in Christ. And Peter says that it consistently manifests itself in doing what is right, in doing good. Whether that's in relationship to the government, 2.13 to 7, or within the relationship of a slave to a master, or an employee to an employer in our context, 2.18 to 25, or within the relationships in the home, 3.1 to 7, or within the relationships in the body of Christ, 3.8, or in the face of persecution in evil society, 3.9 and following. Those who have been born of God begin to reflect God's character. And when they begin to reflect his character, it's manifested in doing what is right, Peter says. In particular, in this section of 2.13 to 3.6, in submitting to those whom God has sovereignly placed over us. Now, last week, we looked at chapter 2, verses 13 to 17, and the submission of the Christian citizen to the civil government. And so that leads us tonight now to chapter 2, verses 18 to 20, where we see the submission of the Christian household slave to his master. I just want to read 1 Peter 2, verses 18 to 25, so that you can see the wider context here. Notice Peter writes, starting in verse 18, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor... If for the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed, for you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Well, many times believers feel trapped as they find themselves under the authority of someone who is harsh and oppressive and unkind and unjust and unfair. And they feel trapped because oftentimes breaking free isn't an option for them. It certainly wasn't for the household slaves to whom Peter was writing here in verse 18. And certainly as a Christian, taking revenge isn't an option. And so we find it very difficult at times to continue living under this kind of oppression. And so the question is, what do we do? How do we respond? How would God have us to think and live in these kinds of difficult and painful circumstances in order that we might glorify him and be a radiant testimony to the watching world around us? Well, here in 1 Peter 2, verses 18 to 20, Peter provides us with some helpful instruction regarding this very thing. In fact, as we look at 1 Peter 2, verses 18 to 20 tonight, we're going to find that Peter provides for us two key elements of his instruction regarding slaves submitting to their masters. First, we're going to see the mandate for slaves to submit to their masters in verse 18. And then second, we're going to see the motivation for why slaves should submit to their masters in verses 18 to 20. Before we begin to look at these two elements, let me just say up front that while the divine plan of action that we see outlined here is addressed specifically to household slaves who are under the authority of their masters. At the same time, we're going to see that there are general overarching principles in this passage that are applicable to our relationship to any kind of legitimate authority that God has placed over us. Whether you're a child being treated unfairly by your parents, a citizen by the government, an employee by your boss, a wife by your husband, whatever the circumstances may be, Peter is going to tell us how to respond in a way that honors God and serves as a testimony to the watching world. And if you're truly in Christ tonight, the good news is that regardless of how that other person is treating you, God not only wants you to respond in the way that's outlined in this passage, 
but he will give you the divine strength and ability to do so. And therein lies true freedom, even if you can't escape the difficult situation and circumstances that you find yourself in. And therein lies the freedom of knowing that you're not a prisoner to how someone else is treating you. You see, while you may not be able to control your circumstances, and while you may not be able to control other people and how they treat you, you can control how you respond. And that's really God's main concern. Not necessarily changing our circumstances or removing us from those circumstances, but changing us and empowering us in the midst of those circumstances to respond rightly by being submissive with all fear and by doing what is right and by enduring harsh and unjust treatment with patience after the pattern of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we're going to see next week in verses 21 to 25. And so again, here in 1 Peter 2, 18 to 20, Peter provides for us two key elements of his instruction regarding slaves submitting to their masters. Notice first the mandate for slaves to submit to their masters in verse 18. Peter writes here in verse 18, servants, here it is, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. Now this word servants here, oikates, and we see in verse 18 is not the ordinary word for a servant, which is diakonos, or the ordinary word for a slave, which is doulos. This word refers specifically to a household slave. In other words, this is either someone who is born into a household or who has voluntarily sold themselves into a household for financial reasons. And as a household slave, these individuals actually work side by side with those who are free. And so don't necessarily think of these servants, these slaves, as being at the bottom of the social ladder. Don't think of these slaves as being like the slaves of 19th century America Although some of them did lead genuinely miserable lives, they were sub and were subjected to what we might they, they and they were subjected to what we might think of as slave labor, many others served as doctors, teachers, musicians, even managers of the entire household. So they held a wide range of roles as household slaves or servants. And yet one thing is that they all had in common is that they were not free. They were indeed slaves. They were not independent. They lived under the authority of their masters who owned them. Now, some of them were able to purchase their freedom, but as long as they were slaves, as long as they bound themselves in that role, they had no real legal rights, and as a result, they were susceptible to how their master might be inclined to treat them. You see, the reason that Peter singles out servants here, household slaves, and addresses them in particular is because many of his readers likely served in that role. In fact, the master, servant, or slave relationship that we see here in verse 18 was the most common employer-employee relationship that existed in that time and in that place. And because we live in a fallen world, and because we find ourselves with sinners in authority over us at times, we're not treated so well by those who have the right to tell us what to do. And I'm guessing that this was somewhat of a common problem in Peter's day because what you see here is an emphasis on masters who are less than good and gentle and gracious and kind and fair. In fact, if you look at verses 18 to 20 to try to get some insight into the situation that Peter is addressing, you'll find that Peter speaks of submitting to masters whom he describes in four ways here. Notice first, he describes them as unreasonable. Look at verse 18. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, that would be a little bit easier, but also to those who are unreasonable. You see that? Unreasonable. Your translation may say harsh or unjust. It's the Greek word scoliosis. Literally means crooked or curved or bent from where we get our English word scoliosis when somebody has issues with a curved spine, right? Right? It's often used metaphorically like it is here to refer to those who are morally twisted or morally crooked or morally perverse in the sense that they're unjust and unfair. They place unreasonable demands on those who are under them. They're cruel and wicked in the way that they treat their subordinates. Some of you are thinking, hey, you've met my boss. <laughs> Second, Peter says, they cause you sorrow. Not only are they unreasonable, but they cause you sorrow because they're unreasonable. 
Look at verse 19, for this finds favor, if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows. And so the way that you're treated causes you internal grief and sorrow and anguish and emotional pain. It's a difficult circumstance to be living under. You're to the point where you need to strive to press on and endure the weight of the situation. Third, notice they cause you to suffer unjustly. Notice Peter refers at the end of verse 19 to a person who bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. The New King James says suffering wrongly. Because this word describes not just the suffering that's part of normal life and living in a fallen world like disease and things like that, but rather the suffering that comes from being treated in a way that's wrong, that's unfair, that's unjust. That's genuinely undeserved, at least from a human standpoint. And then fourth, they treat you harshly. Look at verse 20. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, literally you're beaten for sinning, you endure it with patience. And so think about it. In the midst of this kind of treatment, unreasonable, causing you sorrow, suffering unjustly, treated harshly, in the midst of all of this, the temptation is to think that if the authority that God has placed over me is not being godly, then I don't have to submit. Isn't that the temptation? Isn't that the mindset that we often bring to the table in these sort of situations and circumstances? We think that if a person in authority over us is treating us unfairly, unjustly, unreasonably, in a way that we don't think is right, then we're no longer bound to submit to that person. Then we're justified in disobeying them. But what does Peter say? Peter's very clear, verse 18, servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable, those who are harsh and unfair. Now again, we talked about this word submit last week, hupatasso. It's a compound word in Greek made up of the preposition hupo, which means under, and the verb tasso, which means to order, arrange, set in place. And so literally it means to set something in place under something else. And so here in verse 18, it involves placing ourselves under, willingly and voluntarily placing ourselves under the authority that God has placed over us by obeying them. Now, be submissive here is a present participle in the Greek text, but it's functioning as an imperative here, as a command, piggybacking off of the imperatival force of the verb, the command, submit in verse 13. And the present tense here denotes that this is our continual, ongoing obligation to human authorities that have been placed over us. In this case, servants are to constantly and continually be submissive to their masters. This isn't just something that they're to do sporadically based on whether they feel like it or not, or whether or not their masters deserve it, or whether or not they think they're being treated fairly or reasonably. Now, this is not an option for them to consider, but a command for them to continually obey. It's a continual obligation that's binding upon them. And you see, what this involves, again, is not only recognizing someone's authority over us, but also the humility of submitting to that authority and obedience. And so the command's real simple. Willingly subject, willingly place yourself under the authority and command of another. And you see, one of the primary, if not the primary, manifestation of sin in our life is the stubborn pursuit of self-rule. We want to be in charge of our own lives. We want to be able to call the shots. We want to do whatever we want to do, whenever we want to do it, however we want to do it, and we don't want anyone telling us differently. We don't want to be under the authority or rule of anyone but ourselves. There's a native unwillingness in all of us, in all of our hearts, to yield to the authority of others over us. A native resentment of and resistance to submitting to authority. And so here's another example, really, of the gospel implication that believers are to be different than that. Folks, we don't live for self-rule. We actually live a life of humble submission to others. That's what the gospel produces in someone who's truly converted especially inside the confines of official relationships like government, like the workplace, like home, and even in the church where God has sovereignly placed leaders over us. You see, the evidence and the manifestation of grace in our lives is that we yield ourselves rather than assert ourselves or claim rights for ourselves. 
And the reason is because we follow Christ. He humbled himself and became a slave, Philippians 2, 6 to 8. 1 Peter 2, 21 to 25, as we're going to see next week, is the example of this. And so we are to be marked by a Christ-likeness that isn't punch drunk with autonomy, where it's all about what I want to do and my perceived rights. And so Peter lays it right on the table for them and says, listen, you need to be willing to place yourself under the authority of those whom God has sovereignly placed over you. And folks, we need to guard ourselves against the sinful pride that gets dressed up and then applauded as a free spirit. We like to think of that as a virtue. We say, oh, that person's just a free spirit. They just love to do their own thing. Folks, nowhere in Scripture is that applauded as a commendable virtue. That's not what the Scriptures tell us. The life of the believer is a life that is willingly yielded to the God-given authority of others not cloaking defiance and insubordination under the label of a free spirit, or we're essentially just exalting self-rule. You see, while that may be applauded in the culture, it's not applauded in the scriptures. And folks, the culture is not to set the value system for believers. God's word is to do that. And all throughout the scriptures, we're called to follow and to submit and to yield. We're not called to defy and to exalt ourselves and to pursue our own way and to pursue our own path. And if Peter could talk to slaves and command them to submit to their unjust masters, folks, how much more does that apply to us who are free? I mean, if anybody should be able to just toss aside this command to submit and say, look, this isn't right, this isn't fair, this isn't just, it would certainly be slaves who are being treated as property rather than as human beings who are created in the image of God. And yet Peter doesn't tell them to toss it aside. He tells them to submit to the authority that God has sovereignly placed over them because that's supposed to be the pattern of life that marks us off as different from the unbelieving world around us. We respond in a way that is countercultural in a way that is contrary to the prevailing response of the unbeliever, which is to rise up and to rebel and to refuse to submit rather than yielding and submitting. And so as you think about this scenario where you find yourself submitting to the authority of someone who's harsh and cruel and unjust, the first step in your response to this unjust authority is one, to recognize the authority that God has given to that person over you. And then number two, to humble yourself and to submit to God by submitting to that person's God-given authority. Again, as I mentioned last week, there are certainly limits to our submission to human authority. The only time that it's morally permissible to disobey the human authority is if that authority is requiring you to sin against God. Either by commanding you to do something that God forbids or by forbidding you to do something that God commands. Obviously, in those rare cases, you have a moral obligation to obey God and to respectfully disobey the human authority. But again, those are rare exceptions. And just because we're being treated unreasonably and unfairly doesn't mean that we're necessarily being asked to sin against God and that we have a right to disobey and to rebel against that authority. We may not like the treatment, and certainly none of us do, but Peter says we're still obligated to submit. And obviously, folks, Christ is the ultimate example of this, as we'll see in verses 21 to 25. And folks, think about it. If anyone had a right to rebel, it was him. And he didn't. And he left us a model, a pattern to follow. A servant is not greater than their master. And so God commands us to submit, even if the things that we're required to do seem unreasonable to us. Even if the ways that we're being treated seem unfair and unjust and, un and harsh to us. God calls us to submit to him with a heart of trust that he will bless in that situation because our greatest desire is to bring honor to his name. Now, let me just say that submitting to unjust authority when they're mistreating you out of a heart of submission to divine authority will ultimately bring a measure of joy and peace and comfort in and of itself. Because when you know that you're doing the right thing, and when you know that you're doing it for the right reason, namely God's glory, 
that no matter how you're treated in this life, there will be a joy that cannot be touched or taken by the circumstances of life. Isn't that what Jesus said? I write these things to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. He just said in John 15, 10, the previous verse, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I abide in the Father's love and keep his commandments. You want fullness of joy? The pathway is obedience to God. The commands of God are a means of grace that enable us to abide in his love and experience fullness of joy. And so, while the joy in the midst of that suffering may not take away the pain and the sorrow, it will certainly allow you to endure and to persevere in faithfulness through the pain and the sorrow, knowing that you can pillow your head at night with a clear conscience that you're being faithful to God. And in the end, he's going to vindicate you. And folks, there's far more value in living a life of godliness and righteousness that submits to God despite the pain than there is in living a life of rebellion against God to try to avoid the pain and the suffering. And so Peter writes, servants, be submissive to your masters. That's the mandate for slaves to submit to their masters, even unreasonable ones. And by application for us to submit to our employers, even to unreasonable ones. But then notice that Peter adds this little prepositional phrase here describing the character or the manner of this submission. It says, servants, be submissive to your masters, watch this, with all respect. Now the word translated respect here is the Greek word phobos, which literally means fear. And so there's some debate as to whether Peter means that they're to be submissive to their masters with all respect or fear of their masters. Or whether Peter means that they're to be submissive to their masters out of a reverence or fear of God. And certainly I lean towards that second one, that they're to be submissive to their masters out of a reverence or fear of God. And I do so because Peter already addressed this issue back in chapter 1, verse 17. Remember he wrote there, if you address as father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, he said, conduct yourself in fear during the time of your stay here on earth. So one of the governing commands that Peter gives throughout this letter is that we're to conduct the totality of our lives in fear or reverence of God. And then look at chapter 2, verse 17. In the immediate context here, Peter writes, Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And then in the very next verse, 2.18, he says, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect or fear. And so even the verse before this in 2.17 is said to fear God. Look at chapter 3, verse 2. He says, as they, speaking of wives, he says, as they observe your chaste and respectful or literally reverent or fearful behavior. Same word for fear. And the question in there is that, is that a fear of the husband or is that a fear of God? And I would argue it's a fear of God. It's reverent behavior owing to a fear of God. Because notice in 3, 6, Peter says, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. And then he says in 3.14, and do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. And so not only does Peter on the one hand tell us to fear God, 1.17, 2.17, but he also tells us on the other hand that we're not to fear man, 3.6 and 3.14. And so I don't think he'd say in 2.18, servants be submissive to your masters with all fear and have that reflect itself toward the master, it has its reflection towards God. In other words, the reason you submit to your masters is because you fear God. You have a reverence for him, and you want to honor him. And that fits with the motivations that he'll give in the rest of the verse. Notice verse 19. He says, for this finds favor if for the sake of conscience toward God a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. And at the end of verse 20, this finds favor with God. And so I think the point is be submissive to your masters out of a reverence or a fear of God. That's why he can say in 2.19 that it's a matter of conscience towards God. And in 2.20, it finds favor with God. And so what Peter wants them to realize is that their specific relationship to their master has a God word referent to it. You submit to your earthly master because you fear God. And so insubordination to your master is ultimately insubordination to God then, and disobedience to your master is ultimately disobedience to God. And so Peter roots their submission and their commitment to God here. That's the character of this submission, an all reverence or fear of God. 
But notice that Peter goes on then to describe not only the character of this submission, but the comprehensiveness of this submission. Notice he writes, servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect. Watch this. Not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. And so Peter makes it very clear here that the responsibility to submit doesn't apply only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable, those who are morally crooked and perverse and twisted. In other words, you're not just required to submit to those who are nice to you and who treat you well. You're also required to, those, to submit to those who are morally crooked and unreasonable and place all kinds of unreasonable demands on you. Again, Peter's addressing slaves here who don't have much choice in the matter. They can't opt out like we can and look for a new job. They can't put in for a transfer request for a different owner. But what they could do wrongly is to use the unworthiness of their master to excuse their need to submit. Saying, this guy is wicked and therefore I don't have to submit to him. I'm not morally obligated to do that. And Peter's saying, no, the unworthiness of your master does not invalidate your responsibility to submit. Amen. Just like the government. I mean, the Roman Empire, led by wicked Nero, could hardly be considered a worthy government to submit to. And yet Peter said in 2.13, submit. And we have a tendency to excuse our disobedience by deflecting attention away from our responsibility to the unworthiness of the person that we're supposed to submit to, don't we? I mean, we do it across the board. Kids think that their parents are unreasonable and therefore they don't have to submit to them and obey them. Wives think that their husband is either domineering or controlling on the one hand or either passive or neglectful on the other hand and that's unworthy of following and so they don't have to submit to him. Husbands take their responsibilities to submit their wills and to show Christ-like love to their wife and they excuse it because of some perceived flaw in the wife. We think, look, I don't buy this government. I don't like this president, and so I don't have to submit. Well, my boss is this or that, and therefore I don't have to do what he says. The whole point that Peter's making here is that doesn't fly. Not for a Christian who's received the new birth and has a new life. Peter explicitly sub says, submit not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. You see, submission is easy when you agree with the person that you're submitting to, right? When they're good and gentle and they're essentially telling you what you want to do already. That doesn't require any grace. Any unbeliever submits under those circumstances. The litmus test, folks, that separates the true believer from the unbeliever becomes when you don't agree with what they're asking you to do. When they're unreasonable. You see, the mark of having the new birth is that it issues in a new life. And by God's grace, you submit anyway because you fear God and you want to honor Him. And so as we think about applying this passage to ourselves, we as believers have an obligation to submit. If our master or boss is unreasonable, his faults don't excuse our obedience to God in this matter. Well, this doesn't mean that you can never go and look for another job. Sometimes that may be necessary. You may be violating your conscience. He may not be paying you and you can't provide for your family. There's all kinds of scenarios. We're not saying that you can never go and look for another job. It just means that while you're at your current job, you don't have the right to rebel and to not submit because your employer is unreasonable. You see, we're real prone to look for reasons not to obey God. And usually we look for that reason and some fault in somebody who's been placed over us. They blew it and so I'm free. They're this or they're that and therefore I don't have to submit. But Peter doesn't give us that option. Remember, again, God is the top of every authority structure. And so his authority gets handed down and so if somewhere along the way an employer chooses to defy God and commands us to defy God as well, then we must obey God rather than man. Obviously, the text does not give permission for an employee to lie because the employer told him to do it. You understand that? But again, those are the rare exceptions, not the rule here. 
And so if your employer is not commanding you to sin or do something God forbids or forbidding you to do something God commands, you must submit to them even if they're unreasonable, unjust, unfair. And so the first key element is the mandate for slaves to submit to their masters, verse 18. Peter says, servants, be submissive to your masters. And under that, we saw the character of this submission, namely with all reverence or fear of God. And then we saw the comprehensiveness of this submission, not only to those who are good and gentle, but to those who are unreasonable. Now, obviously, that's easy to talk about in theory, but it's difficult to live in practice, right? And so that's why Peter goes and he immediately gives us some motivations for obeying the command here in verse 18. So we move now from the mandate for slaves to submit to their masters in verse 18 to second, the motivation for why slaves should submit to their masters in verses 19 to 20. So notice Peter writes here in verse 19, for or because, so here comes an explanation of why you should obey verse 18, for or because this finds favor with God. If for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly, for what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. And so if we ask ourselves, why should I submit to an unreasonable or crooked master? Peter's answer here in verses 19 to 20 would be because God's blessing comes to those who do what is right and patiently endure undeserved suffering. I use the word blessing. Peter uses the word favor here in the NASB. Notice he says at the beginning of verse 19, this finds favor with God. And then notice at the end of verse 20, he repeats it. This finds favor with God. So it's kind of like an inclusio. He parks favor at the beginning of verse 19 and at the end of verse 20 is the motivation to submit here. And so this is, we know, about favor or blessing from God. Now, the word he uses is literally charis in the Greek. It's usually translated grace. This finds grace from God. Peter's probably, as most commentators would say, and I would agree, pulling from Luke 6, verses 32 to 35 here, where Jesus uses the same Greek word charis three times, translated credit or reward there. He says, look, what credit or reward is there if you love those who love you? What credit or reward do you have if you do good to those who do good to you? What credit or reward do you have if you lend to those who lend to you? He says, don't pagan unbelievers do the same thing? And so his point is that you're supposed to be qualitatively different than the unbeliever. And so he calls us to do more than simply what the unbeliever does. He calls in that context for us to actually love our enemies, to do good to them, to lend to those who can't repay us. And you know why? He says that when you do this, you'll not only prove to be sons of the Most High, but your reward will be great. Talking about in heaven, eternal life. Not because you're earning that, but you're proving to be sons, and the ultimate result of that is reward, eternal reward. And in Peter, he says the same kind of response, so he says that kind of response to your enemies finds reward with God, Jesus says. And you know what Peter's saying here? When you patiently endure undeserved suffering for doing what is right, you not only prove to be genuine believers that your faith is real, but this finds blessing, favor, reward from God. You're going to be rewarded by God on the last day. And so let that motivate you to do what is right and to submit even to unjust and unreasonable masters. Now, why do I say that God's blessing or reward comes to those who do what is right and patiently endure undeserved suffering? Well, verse 19 says, when suffering unjustly. And then in verse 20, Peter even makes a contrast between the kind of punishment that comes properly and the kind that doesn't. Notice in verse 20 that both servants here are suffering at the hands of an unjust authority, and both are seeking to endure their way through it, and yet there's a significant difference between the two. In the first scenario, the servant is being harshly treated. Why? Because of their sin. Notice Peter says in verse 20, what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? And so Peter's saying, look, there's no credit, there's no favor, there's no blessing, there's no reward from God for you patiently enduring harsh treatment that you brought upon yourself because of your sin. 
In fact, over in a similar context in 4.15, where Peter's talking about suffering for the faith, suffering as a Christian, he says, make sure none of you suffers as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or a troublesome meddler. And why does he say that? Because this is the kind of suffering that counts for nothing in the sight of God. You see, some people play the martyr, and they're always complaining about how mean their boss is or how oppressive their parents are, or how difficult their husband is, or how difficult it is to submit to this authority over them, and how they're suffering because of their faith in Christ. And yet behind it all, if the truth be known, much of their suffering has come upon them, not because of their faith in Christ, but because they're sinning. Now that's not always the case, of course, but sometimes it is. You see, some people, and maybe you've met someone like this, so, you know, my boss is always on my case. He's always picking on me because I'm a Christian. And yet the reality is your boss is always picking on you because you're a lousy worker. You're lazy. You're irresponsible. You show up late. You don't do what you're supposed to do. You steal time from your employer. You see, in that situation, your unbelieving boss may indeed be yelling at you. He may be harsh to you in response to your laziness and poor work ethic. And even though in the midst of that kind of treatment from your boss, you're able to endure that harsh treatment with a great deal of patience, God is not impressed, Peter says. There's no blessing, there's no favor, there's no reward from God because you brought suffering upon yourself because of your sin and then you go patiently endure it. But notice Peter says in verse, or notice what Peter says in verse 20, for what credit is there when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? The obvious answer, the rhetorical question is there's no credit. There's no well done, good and faithful servant from your heavenly father. John MacArthur writes, believers who sin deserve chastening and they ought to endure it with patience. Wayne Grudem puts it this way, he said, patient endurance of justly deserved punishment is not remarkable or especially commendable. Many wrongdoers know that they are getting what they deserve and bear the punishment without complaint, end quote. Nothing commendable before God about that. But notice the second half of verse 20, but... If when you do what is right, so you're not sinning now, you're doing what is right, and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. This is commendable before God. This finds reward from God. And so if I sin, and then I get punished for that, and endure it with patience, what credit is that? What favor or blessing or reward comes from sinning and getting punished and enduring it with patience? Peter says there's none. On the other hand... If I'm doing what is right and I suffer for it patiently, for doing what is right, he says, this finds favor or blessing from God. So let's say I decide to steal from my employer, either actual money or simply just time by not working when I'm supposed to be working. Let's say I'm lazy or I'm irresponsible and I show up late all the time. I don't do what I'm called upon to do and my employer either docks my pay or he actually fires me. Well, in response to that, I patiently endure that treatment. Peter would say, what credit is that? I mean, you got what you deserved at the end of the day. But if I've been faithful, I've been responsible, I've been a hardworking employee, I always show up on time, I always work heartily unto the Lord as a person of diligence and integrity, I'm concerned about my testimony in the workplace, I always submit to my employer, I don't steal time by slacking off or surfing the internet when I'm getting paid to work. And yet, because I won't lie for my employer, I won't be dishonest to try to sell one of our products, or I won't go out and get drunk at the bar with the company after work, and my employer now wants to dock my pay or he wants to fire me for not being a team player because I won't get out, go out and get drunk with the guys, or for not being willing to lie to promote the company, then that's the undeserved suffering that Peter's referring to here. That's the difference that Peter's talking about. When Peter says that there's a certain kind of behavior in the midst of undeserved, unjust suffering, that is in the midst of suffering for doing what's right, that Peter says there's a kind of response that finds blessing or favor from God. And he says it's doing what's right. Notice what, what, what the kind of response is that finds blessing or favor from God. Notice verse 19. He says, For this finds favor... If for the sake of conscience toward God, a person, watch this, bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. Verse 20, what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, watch this, you endure it with patience. But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. And so three times in these two verses, Peter helps us to understand the kind of response 
that receives God's approval or blessing when suffering for doing what's right. He says it's patiently enduring in that circumstance. It's the kind of response that in the midst of pressure stands firm. It doesn't cave in under the pressure and sin by compromising to avoid the suffering or sin by complaining or gossiping or slandering or getting angry or retaliating. No, it actually holds up. It bears up under the sorrows. It remains steadfast in the face of this unjust treatment. It doesn't give in or sin or compromise. Well, the biblical concept of endurance is a major facet of the godly life that seeks to follow Christ. For example, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 12, 1 to 3, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run, watch this, with endurance the race that is set before us. Fixing our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And so if we've come to follow Christ, we're to follow him with the endurance that reflects his endurance. He went through unjust, undeserved suffering. He was harshly treated, had sorrow upon sorrow heaped on him, which he did not deserve, and yet he patiently endured it in faith. And Peter t is telling us that that's what we're called to do, to follow his example of patient endurance in the midst of unjust suffering for doing what is right. In fact, this is the mark of spiritual maturity. You remember James? He says in James 1, 2-4 that... God sovereignly brings trials into our lives. And when they come into our lives, instead of resenting those trials and murmuring and complaining about them, we should actually instead be rejoicing in the midst of them, knowing that they produce endurance. And endurance is an essential part of godliness that brings us to maturity and completeness so that we're lacking in nothing. And so we're to see trials and unjust treatment and difficult circumstances as a blessing from God that builds endurance and helps us to stand firm after the pattern of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen, folks, a life which never meets spiritual resistance is going to be a very weak spiritual life. We need to develop the godliness of endurance because life in a sin-cursed world is not coasting. It's swimming upstream against the current of the world, and so it takes endurance. And yet, sadly, we live in a culture that tells us that the good life is a life insulated from any trouble and any trial. It's a life that's filled with ease and comfort and pleasure. It's a life that's free from all pain and difficulty. And because we've been more influenced by the world than the word, we spend our days pursuing ease and comfort and pleasure. And the minute that difficulty or trouble or trial or pressure comes, we immediately start to look for relief. We want out of our circumstances. We've been convinced that the shortcut is the best path. And we end up killing ourselves spiritually because we believe that. We're always looking for escapes instead of asking God to give us endurance. We're always asking God to change our circumstances rather than asking God to change us in the midst of our circumstances. Producing endurance within us so that like Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 7-10 can say, I implored the Lord three times to remove this thorn. And when he said no, he said, I'll be well content then with weaknesses, insults, distresses, persecutions, and calamities. This is an opportunity for me to cultivate endurance, and endurance is the mark of godliness. And so Peter says to his readers, here's the pathway of God's blessing and reward and favor. It's endurance. It's patiently bearing up under unjust treatment. But the question is, how do we do that without being merely some man-centered sto stoic, saying things like, you know, I'm stuck in this horrible job, and I guess I'll just grin and bear it. Or, you know, I'm stuck in this marriage, or I'm stuck in this circumstance, so I'll, I'll just endure it, while kicking and screaming the whole time internally with bitterness and resentment in our hearts towards God and others. How do we endure in a way that is thoroughly Christian, that will truly honor God and be a testimony to the watching world around us, which again is the wider context of chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Well, Peter gives us some insight. Notice what he writes here in verse 19. He says, here's why you're to submit to undressed treatment, for this finds favor, watch this, if for the sake of conscience toward God, 
A person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. You see, the kind of response that God blesses is the kind of response that is rooted in conscience towards God. Now, there's some debate over this word translated conscience here in the NASB because the word can communicate two very distinct nuances of meaning. It can either refer to one's conscience, that is the person's internal mechanism by which they recognize right from wrong, or it can refer to one's consciousness, that is one's consciousness of someone or something, whatever that might be. And so it can mean either conscience or consciousness. Now, both meanings somewhat fit the context here, and so translators are divided on exactly how this should be translated. And so the question is this, is Peter referring to the man who bears up under sorrow for the sake of conscience toward God? Or because he's conscious or mindful of God? Well, for reasons that I think will become clearer as we move on, I think it's more likely that Peter has the second meaning in mind. That is because he's conscious or mindful of God. In other words, the idea is that a person is to bear up patiently under unjust treatment, not simply because he knows that it's the right thing to do before God, although he does know that, but rather because he's mindful of God. He's conscious of God. Conscious, one, of the fact that God is absolutely sovereign over his circumstances and in complete control of them. Conscious, too, of God's continual presence and never failing watch care. Thus, he can submit to God and entrust himself to the one who is continually watching over him, just like Jesus did in 1 Peter 2.23. He's conscious, three, that God will ultimately right all wrongs, just like he did with Christ in 2.23, because he's the one, Peter says, who judges justly. So he, Christ entrusted himself to that one. I know that he's going to right all wrongs, which enables me to submit to an unjust master without resentment, rebelliousness, self-pity, or despair. And he's conscious for that by patiently enduring unjust, undeserved suffering for doing what is right, he will honor and please God, be a radiant testimony for God, and ultimately find favor with and blessing from God, as verses 19 to 20 indicate. In fact, by starting with favor in verse 19 and ending with favor in verse 20, Peter is showing us that the key to the endurance is in fact faith that God will bless endurance. It's faith that on the other side of faithful endurance is blessing and favor and reward from God. And so out of a consciousness of God, I do what is right before him and I patiently endure, one, because I want to honor him and be a radiant testimony for him, and two, because I know that this finds favor with him and will ultimately result in blessing from him. I'm going to receive the eschatological inheritance of future salvation promised me in chapter 1, verses 4 to 5. And so this is a God-centered, faith-generated, faith-motivated obedience here. Wayne Grudem puts it like this. He says, quote, this kind of endurance is something only made possible by being conscious of God and continually trusting Him to care for those rights which have been trampled underfoot by others. At such times, trusting God is not easy, for it goes against our natural inclinations. But it is then that faith shows itself to be genuine, something that in God's eyes is far more precious than gold, chapter 1, verse 7. Then you have God's approval, i.e. you have favor in God's sight, end quote. Just like Jesus in Hebrews 12, 2, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Folks, Jesus went into a more intense experience of unjust, undeserved suffering than anybody in this room will ever experience. And do you know what motivated him through it? It was the joy that was set before him. It was the faith that his father would recognize and reward his faithfulness and his obedience and thus vindicate him and save others through his faithfulness. It was the exaltation that God had promised the Son. Yes, you're going to go to the cross. Yes, you're going to die. But I'm going to raise you from the dead and give you all authority. And you're going to bring many sons to glory through that sacrifice. It was faith in God rewarding him for his faithfulness. And you know what it is that's going to motivate us in the midst of difficult circumstances? Where we're doing the right thing and suffering for it? 
It's faith that God, our Father, not only sees and knows what we're going through because he's ultimately ordained it for our good, but also faith that God will recognize and reward our faithfulness and our obedience and thus vindicate us and perhaps even save others through our faithful witness, as 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12 talks about. It's the realization that God's blessing will come to us as we're faithful. It's the realization that we're going to be in the presence of God very soon. And doing the right thing will find blessing and favor with him and eternal reward from him. And folks, in that moment, all of this suffering will be seen to be light and momentary. In fact, I think that's exactly what Peter's saying. Look at how he parallels this with the example of Christ. Look at 2.21. Speaking of Christ, he says, the one who left you an example for you to follow in his steps. And what was the example of Christ? Verse 22, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats. But what did he do? He kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. That's the example that Peter holds up for his readers here. Christ was able to submit to unjust human authority and to do it with humility and gentleness and godliness because he kept entrusting himself to God the Father, the one who judges righteously. And so back in verse 19, Peter's point is that it finds favor with and blessing from God, your heavenly Father, when you bear up and patiently endure and persevere in the midst of this unjust suffering and harsh treatment with a heart that's filled with faith and a trusting awareness of God's presence and never failing care. Trusting that God's blessing and favor and reward will indeed come to you for your faithfulness. That's what's commendable in the eyes of God, Peter says. You see, it's not that you need to be stoic and tenacious and sort of grit your teeth through the trial and somehow try to make it to the, to the other side on your own. Rather, what you need to do is to recognize that God has not only ordained the authority over you, but also the specific circumstances that you find yourself in. And you need to entrust yourself and those circumstances to the one who's perfectly in control, to the one who will right all wrongs in the end, to the one who judges righteously and who will ultimately vindicate you and bless you and reward you. This is similar to what Peter says over in 419. Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. And so when you find yourself being harshly treated, when you find yourself being treated unfairly, whether it's at work or in a marriage or whatever it is, don't give in to resentment. Don't give in to retaliation or rebellion. Don't give in to self-pity. I mean, think about it. The only one who had a legitimate right to pity himself was Christ, and he never did. Peter says, follow his example. Don't give in to despair and trust yourself to the sovereignty of God. Cast your cares upon him because you know he cares for you. You know he loves you. You know that he's faithfully at work in this situation to bring about his purposes in your heart and in your life. And he will ultimately bless you and reward you with eternal inheritance in the end. You know what Jesus did when he was reviled, when he suffered unjustly? I mean, think about this, folks. You're the creator of the universe. And one of your little dirt clods that you created out of dirt, one of your little created beings starts punching you in the face and spitting on you and starts pressing a crown of thorns in your head and mocking you. I mean, with a word, he could have wiped them all out, but he didn't revile. He didn't threaten back. He kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. He realized, I came to do the will of my Father, and the will of my Father is through the pathway of unjust, undeserved suffering. And as I do the will of my Father, I'm certain that as I emerge on the other side, justice and righteousness will necessarily bring blessing and favor and reward from God. I have faith that God will do what is right. He will right all wrongs in the end and he will ultimately vindicate me and bless me and reward me for my faithfulness. And so I don't just live for the here and now. I'm an alien and a stranger who lives by faith for the day when God makes all wrongs right and rewards me eternally. Folks, we need to live by faith in God having a God-centered view and perspective of life so that when we're suffering unjustly in some relationship, we show that we truly fear God and trust His promises. 
We fear him more than we fear the consequences of obeying him. Well, if I obey him, if I submit, I might lose this or it might mean that. No, I fear God more than I fear the consequences that might come from obeying him, and so I'm not going to disobey him. And we trust him more than we trust the promise that is offered to us through rebelling against that authority over us. So folks, when you find yourself suffering unjustly at the hands of one in authority over you, you must resolve in your heart that regardless of whatever else happens in this situation, regardless of how this person treats me in this situation, regardless of how painful or unfair all of this might be, you must resolve in your heart, I will do what is right in the eyes of God. Because this is what finds favor with and blessing and reward from Him. This is what is precious in his sight. This is what beckons his hidden smile and invokes his blessing. You see, there's a real temptation to retaliate against an unjust boss, or perhaps to become apathetic and to do as little work as possible. It's a real temptation to either seek revenge or to sort of slack off in your responsibility to that authority. Peter says, no, that's not acceptable for those who are in Christ. If you have the new birth, it should issue in a new life. You should be radically different than the fallen unbelievers around you and how they respond to unjust treatment. You must continue to do what's right. You must continue to submit to that authority. You must not only refuse to give in to bitterness and revenge and indifference, you must actually work hard and go the extra mile so that you'd never bring reproach upon Christ and the gospel for doing something wrong that you'd actually be a radiant testimony that says, what is up with that guy? What is up with that girl? He's mistreated, and yet he continues to work hard to go the extra mile for this person that just keeps mistreating him. There's something supernatural about that person. And then what happens? They start asking you for the reason, for the hope that lies within you. Because there's actually something different about you. Folks, that's what Peter is calling for here. And yet the problem is so often when we're in those circumstances, we spend all of our time and all of our energy focusing on what's wrong with the, uh, the employer or the authority figure over us and trying to find his flaws to excuse our behavior. Peter says, no, the key to being freed from this kind of prison is to repent of those thoughts and to lay them aside, thinking, I don't deserve this and I shouldn't do this. And instead, to spend 100% of your time and energy and resources seeking by the grace of God to respond to this person in a way that honors the Lord and will be a testimony before them. That's where true freedom is found, even in the midst of those circumstances that you may not be able to get out of. And so here we see two key elements of his instruction regarding slaves submitting to their masters, the mandate for slaves to submit and the motivations. Namely, because when we're mindful of God and we patiently endure unjust suffering for doing what is right, God's blessing and favor and eternal reward awaits us. Do we really have genuine faith that will motivate obedience in the midst of those circumstances? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this instruction. It's so contrary to how we think natively. Because we start with ourselves, we're the center of everything, and everything revolves around us. And getting what we want, and pursuing what we like, and avoiding what we dislike. And yet, it's very clear that the new birth issues in a new life. Where we recognize the authority figures that you've placed over us, and we humbly and willingly place ourselves under those authority figures. And not just those who treat us well, but even those who are unjust and unfair and unreasonable. And Lord, that requires great grace. And yet, you've made us new. You've given us faith so that your commandments are not burdensome because we see the blessing in them. We see the liberating freedom in them. It's wisest and best to obey you. And so, Lord, help us to remain on the path of patiently enduring for doing what's right when we're so tempted to want to compromise, to get ourselves out from the suffering, from the circumstances. We're so tempted to want to seek relief. I pray that we would seek you to change our hearts.
so that even if the circumstances never change, we could be well content like Paul with difficulties and that we would follow the pattern of our Lord and Savior who kept entrusting himself to you, the one who judges righteously. Lord, if there's any who are not in Christ, I pray that you bring conviction to them and cause them to repent and believe in Christ so that they would be empowered to live in a way that's truly countercultural. It would cause the world to look on and see the transforming power of the gospel. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>